Afternoon, everyone, in this crazy weather. And I send uh, hearty uh, greetings from Janine Benyus and my colleagues in Missoula, Montana, where we're based. We're the Biomimicry Institute, which is a nonprofit education organization. We also have a consulting firm called the Biomimicry Guild, where we work with clients on uh, innovative solutions along the lines that, that Ellen described. Uh, my aim today is to introduce you to this topic, and for those of you that may be familiar with it, maybe take it a little bit deeper, but hopefully provide some insights that are valuable as you're exploring the circular economy and, and some of the work that you're doing. Uh, the way I've structured my talk, and I'm going to accelerate it uh, at the organizer's request, <laughs> is that we're going to talk just a little bit about the, the philosophical underpinnings of biomimicry, and then we'll move to some examples which kind of demonstrate biomimicry in action. And then lastly, we'll describe our approach to biomimicry and how we're uh, working in this emerging field and where we think it's, it's going from here. Uh, before we get started, I'll just quickly say that my background's in business. I'm not a biologist, but I've been in the sustainable development uh, area for about 22 years now. Came into biomimicry about three years ago. And from a personal perspective, the reason I got involved was that for the longest time I was working in the field of sustainability, but I came to realize that I really didn't know a lot about biology or ecology. And a lot of my colleagues were in the same boat too. And as we're moving from sustainability as doing a, something uh, less bad and moving to what is really the model that, for which we should aspire, deep knowledge of biological systems and living systems are imperative. That means we all need to learn this. And that's a lot of what biomimicry is, is really trying to do. It's a turnaround strategy for the human species as we begin to look at how does nature already solve this over the last 3.8 billion years? How, how has nature done this? And how can we learn from nature? And how can we apply that, as the presentation suggests there? applying nature solutions to human problems. And that's what we'll cover today. Here's the, the core insight behind biomimicry. And it's, it's a, it's a re-articulation of a lot of the things that you probably heard over the last couple of days, including the last speaker. And the core insight is that well-adapted life creates conditions conducive to life. Meaning that as organisms go, as well-adapted organisms go about their daily life, they're part of a chain of being that's creating conditions in which other life can, can, uh, can flourish, can fit and flourish. It's all interconnected. A lot of you probably heard that in, in a lot, uh, rephrased in a lot of different ways. We heard about thermodynamics today. We heard a lot about your, your physics of organisms. This is maybe a little bit more poetic, but it's really s saying the same thing. That's our core insight that we work from at the Biomimicry Institute and Guild. Biomimicry is not a new idea. As we heard also, cultures have been looking to nature for eons, and there's a lot of incredibly valuable indigenous knowledge. Our challenge in, in the future is as modern humans in a modern society, how do we take the biological knowledge that's relevant to our society and to our high-tech needs and desires and begin to incorporate that? And what biomimicry is looking to is the new techniques, methods, tools of biology to help us get there. But it's, again, it's not a new idea, and here's uh, one of my favorite quotes around biomimicry, and this is Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, a, a, a modern Western master, saying that those who are inspired by a model other than nature, a mistress above all masters are laboring in vain. That's another call, core principle that we look to. The idea that nature has already solved a lot of the problems that we have, it's just our ability to look deep enough to find where that solution lies. So a couple of different ways that we approach this. Uh, the philosophical orientation around biomimicry. First of all, we look to uh, designing from nature as a, nature as a model in what we call champion adapters. These are organisms that have been fitting and flourishing in a specific place for hundreds of thousands of years often. And what can we learn from these champion adapters about how they move, how they protect from abiotic factors, how they do chemistry, how they do all the things that they do? How can we look for those as a model that we can then begin to learn from and apply to our own problems, which in many cases, everything from locomotion to flight to purification of water to structure, all those things nature has already solved and, and many times a very elegant, energy efficient uh, solution that we can look to. So that's nature's model. We also say that nature is measure, where we begin to look at designing with nature so that we can begin to look at our solutions and compare them against how has nature already solved this. And what are what we call the ecological performance standards of that particular organism's solutions? How is it performing? What's it doing with CO2? What's it doing with nutrient cycling? How is it modifying um, its environment? Those type of things allow us a framework by which we can then look to our designs and say, how well do they compare against how nature has already solved this? So that's, the, that's uh, nature as measure. 
And then we look at nature as a mentor, and this is designed for the environment in what we call the deepest and widest sense. This is taking the models of nature along with the measures of nature and then looking at it as a systems perspective where we begin to look at nature as not something that we extract from, but something that we learn from. And that's a major shift as we look into our modern economy. Nature, we learn from it. We're mentored by nature solutions as opposed to extracting things from nature. So a question could arise, why do humans need models, measures, and mentors? <laughs> Turns out, <laughs> the main reason is that we're a really young species. If you think about how long humans have been around in the course of 3.8 billion years, let's say modern humans have been around roughly 200,000 years, we're, we're new kids on the block. We have just arrived on this spaceship Earth. We need the mentoring. We need to figure out what does it mean and how do we best fit and flourish in a place called Earth. Where are we going to look for that? Biomimicry says look to nature. So now let's switch to some examples that can start to show what biomimicry looks like in action. These are some uh, pairings of photos that a lot of times we use to demonstrate the, the biological inspiration that goes to the technology. Just quickly, does anybody know what that uh, thing is on the left-hand side of the photograph? Is it an anthill? Anthill? Close. Termite, termite mound, yeah, it's a termite mound. There's a, a building in Zimbabwe where an architect uh, from RUP Engineering looked at the passive ventilation systems of termite mounds, which inspired what's a building in, in Har uh, Harare, Zimbabwe called the Eastgate Building that directly mimics this passive ventilation and they have no mechanical heating or cooling systems that, that uh, mimics that technology to, in order to move airflow through the building. How about the next one? Humpback whale. Humpback whale, very good. Turns out the humpback whale has something called tubercles on the edges of its fins that allows it to be very streamlined in its fluid dynamics as it's moving through the water. There's a company that's mimicked that in wind turbine blades and it's looking for a lot of different, uh, diff different industrial applications to mimic the exact mathematics in fluid dynamics and uh, air dynamics around these tubercles which allow the humpback whale to, to swim very uh, swiftly and efficiently and also allows turbine blades to move through the air in a very efficient manner. How about the next one? What's that? No, it's a, um, I've forgotten the name of the plant. <laughs> but uh, it, this is a, the technology that it's, that's being mimicked there is artificial photosynthesis. So how do we move from uh, the, the chemistry that we're using now in solar technology to a direct mimic, uh, mimicry of photosynthesis like we have in plants as we're turning sunlight into electricity? Some more examples to give you an idea of how this works. And I'd recommend if you're interested in this topic that you go to Business Week and just type in biomimicry. They did a whole set of uh, technology um, kind of review around biomimicry and the, and the whole topic. This one, a uh, very interesting one, one of the more famous ones is mimicking the kingfisher's beak in the Japanese uh, bullet train. Uh, designers had a real problem because of the speeds of the train going through the tunnel openings. They were creating a, a, a sonic boom. You can imagine a, uh, a train that's going that fast through a very narrow tunnel, pushes the air out, explodes the air on the other side, sonic booms. So they looked to a kingfisher beak, uh, one of the designers, and said kingfishers are able, when, when they're very stealthily going after fish, they enter the water at an incredible rate of speed, but they also do it in a way that, that minimizes the disturbance of the water to keep the fish from swimming away. So they directly mimic the mathematics of that kingfisher beak onto the nose of that, uh, the Japanese bullet train. They also mimic some owl feathers because they also were wanting to reduce drag and um, sound vibration on the side of the, uh, the train. And it turns out the side of the train has these very small um, fin-like protrusions which owl feathers also have to, to reduce sound when they're going after their prey. How much time do I have? Does anybody know how long I've been talking? Okay. okay. <laughs> um, this is a really interesting Scottish company. Has anybody heard, ever heard of Brinker Technology in Aberdeen? They're an oil pipeline company. They manage uh, hundreds, you've heard of them, uh, hundreds of thousands of miles of these pipelines for moving oil. And one of their biggest problems is maintaining the integrity of the in insides of those pipes. As the pipes begin to deteriorate, finding, detecting, and repairing those is a big problem. They look to the human vascular system, which uses a platelet to go, and the platelets coagulate at a place where our uh, venous system has a weakness. They created a technology to send platelets through their pipes, which can detect a weak spot and gather around it, which sends a radio signal back out that there's a problem with that pipe. 
that technology, that innovation was directly mimicked and inspired by the self-healing properties of our uh, human venous system. Here's a really interesting company um, that's making BioWave, BioStream, and BioBase, three of their main products. And they're looking at underwater, uh, or underwater systems to mimic in, in a variety of uh, solutions. One is um, a sea fan uh, type structure that moves in the, uh, within tides and creates mechanical energy as tides and tidal motions move. There's another one that uses the back end of a uh, tail and the fluid dynamics around the tail, uh, tail fin of a fish so that it can crank around and follow the tidal and it, uh, waves and as the tide moves across it a lot like a fish's fin, it also moves back and forth and creates me mechanical energy. And then the last one is an anchoring system that anchors a lot of the way that sea plants uh, embed themselves through their roots into the ocean floor and they're using that for uh, setting up a lot of these anchoring systems in the ocean. I'm just moving through these really quickly so you get an idea of, of uh, some applications of biomimicry in action. Each one of these has a very deep and rich case history, as you might imagine, but we're going to breeze through these. So here's probably the most impactful and interesting one of them all, uh, Calera. Has anybody heard of Calera? Relatively new company, uh, California company. They just closed a gigantic round of funding from, uh, I think, uh, Kleiner Perkins, the big venture capital company in uh, Silicon Valley. They're making a cement product that is directly mimicking uh, the cal calcium carbonate formation of coral reefs, which is using CO2 as a feedstock to basically create a, uh, a cementitious-like um, uh, property that could be a replacement for, for cement. So imagine if we start to take one of our most energy-intensive CO2-emitting um, industries, which is cement formation, and we flipped that around and we started using CO2 and sequestering that from the atmosphere and fixing it into our building structures, basically mimicking the strength and the biochemistry of, of a coral reef. I think this is a very promising technology and could be one of Biomimicry's uh, next big success stories. If you want to learn more about this, go to the Wall Street Journal and type in just that word, Calera, and you'll, there's a really interesting article about them. Uh, here's Nissan. Nissan is looking at cars of the future. They've been doing experiments with robotic cars. Uh, as our urban areas are going to be, become increasingly congested over time, we're looking at ways that cars need to become more intelligent. They're looking at something called swarm intelligence, which is a way that fish and birds and insects all maneuver together in these very tight formations. And you, I'm sure you've seen birds and fish, how they stay very close together, but they never collide. Have you ever seen a fish or a bee collide? They never collide. And one of the reasons is they follow some very simple rules in the way that they maneuver. It's an algorithm that they follow. They, they maintain a certain amount of space between themselves around in a 180 degree view. That's the way fish do it. So Nissan took that algorithm and has embedded it in a robotics car technology that allows cars to go on autopilot and mimic like a fish school behavior so that the whole swarm of cars can move in and around objects and there's never any collision. And so they've got hundreds of these little robotic cars that they program, they all start running together, and they can go on and off swarm intelligence mode. So they can be driven autonomously, and then when you get into a traffic jam, you put it into swarm intelligence mode, and it starts driving itself. It's pretty interesting. Uh, another one called the Lotus Effect. This is a company that uh, has mimicked the way that um, water beads on plant leaves and it turns out that the plants have a very self-cleaning, interesting self-cleaning property whereas water uh, beads up on them like this and you see the lotus effect and as the water beads roll around on, on the leaf it actually takes off the dirt and some of the particulate on the leaves so that it doesn't clog up their photosynthesis. 